Hi everyone, it's great to see all these people joining. I'm excited. We'll just give it another minute because I still see people joining in. So let's give it another minute and then we get, get started. Okay, I think, I think we can make a start. So thank you everyone for joining today, open hours with, uh, uh, office hours, sorry, with, uh, with Eben Upton, um, founder of Raspberry Pi. And I'm really excited to be here and uh, be able to get all the questions from you uh, that we could ask directly to Eben. Um, so before, before we get started, I just wanted to say for everyone uh, that is in, can you please ask your, chat, your questions on the chat so that we can take them and, and ask them directly to Eben. Um, so yeah, if you wouldn't mind, that would be great. And uh, let's get started. Eben, welcome. Good to be here, good to be here virtually. Yeah, it's exciting. I'm, I'm really excited about this. It's a great opportunity to ask a lot of questions. I think, uh, I think I'm pretty sure the 22 people online, or maybe 20, 20 people, because we have to take ourselves out, are really excited as well. And they probably have a lot of questions ready. So um, without further ado, I was thinking maybe you could tell us a bit more about yourself, even though I think most people probably know you, but you know, it's still good to give an introduction. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm, my name's Eben. Uh, I've had a very busy decade. I suppose. Uh, I, I founded a thing uh, about 12 years ago called, called the Raspberry Pi Foundation um, with, with the intention of getting young people uh, primarily kind of excited about computers again in the same way that we were back in the 1980s. Um, we've been making and shipping um, single board computers called Raspberry Pis uh, for, uh, since the 29th of February uh, 2012. So we're a little over eight years. Uh, we've been in business for a little over eight years. Um, shipped about 35 million um, during that uh, during that time um, and, and yeah so you know, we sort of exist to put um, uh, uh, a low cost you kind know, of affordable high performance computers in the hands of people particularly children but really children we sometimes say uh, children of all ages um, eight to eighty um, uh, all over the planet that's amazing I mean it's uh, you said 35 million Raspberry Pi is shipped, and you 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 just told me that you hit that last month, right? So you probably have shipped more than that actually by by now. Yeah, so 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 at some point in at some point in September, we shipped our thirty five millionth uh, Raspberry Pi towards the, the end of September. Um, so yeah, we're probably and we we ship we're going at a run rate of between six and seven hundred thousand Raspberry Pis a month uh, at the moment. Um, so yeah, so we're probably you know uh, not long now till we get to thirty six. Awesome. Cool. And, and I was going to ask you, I mean, I've seen, you know, on Twitter, on social media uh, during this pandemic, everybody sharing stuff about what they've been building on Raspberry Pis, right? Well, what's your experience in terms of number of uh, Raspberry Pis being bought? Has it gone up? Has it gone down? I'm just curious about uh, how that's been looking on your side. It's interesting. I mean, I think we were wondering that in March, you know, which way was this going to go? Um, unequivocally up. I think is the answer. So not just um, we're not just talking about shipping more Raspberry Pis. Uh, we're also talking about more engagement with our the, the other things that Raspberry Pi does. So Raspberry Pi is a not we're not for pro the Raspberry Pi Foundation is a not for profit. We train teachers. We create uh, free online material. We publish magazines. Um, and what's interesting when you look at all of those numbers, um, they all track along. Uh, with with 2019, you know, a little increment, obviously, you know, some growth year on year. And then when you get halfway through March, all of the numbers, whether that's sales of Raspberry Pi or um, search engine, uh, you know, searches for you know, searches from Raspberry Pi, searches for Raspberry Pi, uh, people starting our courses, people downloading our magazines, all of those numbers, they decouple uh, very sharply in the second week of March uh, and then and go upwards. We've had three of our um, four... Um, uh, we've had three of our four uh, largest selling months uh, have happened since March um, of this year, uh, and a lot of that I think that, you know, some of that's been some of that some of that's actually been driven by direct kind of COVID um, mitigation efforts. You know, we've sold some tens of thousands of units into ventilator um, opportunities, but a lot of it's about either people um, uh, either people having more time on their hands, people finding themselves at home and wanting to do something, wanting to spend their furlough time, their lockdown time. Uh, productively uh, or uh, kind of maybe more interesting for our mission uh, it's been about people um, needing to follow along at school needing to work from home needing to study from home and finding that they don't have a client a client pc they don't have a piece of hardware to do that from uh, either because their family has no computing hardware we have hundreds of thousands of children in the uk for example who were sent home with no computer they're sent home you follow along you know go home and study from home but they have no computer to do it on 
Um, or you kind of, you, you also have families who maybe they have PCs and then what they suddenly discover is they need a PC each. So you maybe have a family of four that has two PCs. Um, and then they suddenly discover that two PCs for a family of four isn't enough if everybody is working from home and everyone's studying from home. So that's kind of driven, I think that's driven adoption of Raspberry Pi maybe in, um, in demographics uh, that, that we weren't previously strong in. And I think you touched a really interesting point here uh, that I think we are at a, at a turning point with, uh, you know, with the ARM ecosystem. Uh, we're at a point where actually single board computers like Raspberry Pis, and I'll tell you an interesting, uh, funny story in a second, but um, single board computers like Raspberry Pis can actually become a computer. And I think, you know, you, you, you were, we were talking about this earlier. I think Raspberry Pi 4 is, is effectively a computer, right? And you can use it uh, to run anything you want, right? And it's, uh, it's really interesting that we've gone through this change, right? And, uh, and I think, you know, I was going to ask you, when did this happen, really? Like, when, when, did, when have you seen this change happening? Well, Raspberry Pi, we've always seen ourselves as a PC company. So we, we, we make PCs. But back in 2012, we were shipping a single core machine with a quarter of a gig of RAM uh, and a single core ARM 11. 700 megahertz and we we would call ourselves a pc company um and of course we were a pc company because you know the idea of you know, there isn't one single thing one single performance level one single set of features that defines being a pc so there was certainly a, a minority of pc users who were very happy with the performance that the raspberry pi one provided them with and what's happened is if you sort of see the the pc demand in the pc industry as being a bell curve you know there's a small number of people who are happy with very modest level of performance there are a small number of people you know your hardcore gamers who just need absolutely the fastest thing that you can buy and then there are people in the middle who want to surf the web so uh, and what's happened with each generation of raspberry pi is that it's chewed we've chewed into that bell curve so we've built products with raspberry Pi 1 1 plus 2 3 3 plus we built products which were suitable for a larger and larger and larger fraction of the workloads that people um use client pcs for um, and the interesting thing about Raspberry Pi 4, which launched in June last year, launched on the 24th of June last year, um, is that's for me the one that takes us past the median. It's the one that takes us past the middle of the bell curve. So we now have a product in Raspberry Pi 4 um, at $35, um, which is a perfectly satisfactory um, a PC product for more than 50% of the people who use PCs. Uh, and that was a kind of, that was revolutionary. It was about a factor of three performance increase between the prior product, three plus um, and four. And it really, that big kind of bulge in the middle of the bell curve, that's what Raspberry Pi 4 ate. Um, and what's interesting, of course, is by luck, that came along nine months before this sudden upswing, almost exactly nine months uh, before, I think to, almost to the day, nine months before lockdown in the UK. Um, mm. uh, and and yeah, you know, had that happened a year earlier, I don't think we would have had a product which was it would have been it would have been suitable for the people who want to use lockdown as an opportunity to learn new technical skills, but it wouldn't have been useful as a general purpose computer for people who had been sent home from school and had to get on Teams meeting. Yeah, and uh, you know the story I was going to tell you actually the interesting story is that or the funny story more than interesting is I remember when um, I was at university right and uh, someone brought me the first Raspberry Pi and said. Uh, this, uh, you know, look at this. It's super cool. It's a computer. And I was like, I was looking at the thing and I was like, wait a second, how could that be a computer? I was building computers at the time, right? I was putting together like gaming computers, basically. And uh, I remember, you know, I would spend up to a thousand and more pounds, right? And when this person told me, uh, my colleague was like, oh, this is 35 euros, right? I was in Italy back then. I was like, oh, that can't be a computer, right? And, and it's quite interesting how like, you know, slowly it's become I mean, it, it was real then, but it's more real now, right? Yes. And that's super, yeah. super we have this, this single minded, um, this single minded determination to make that true, right? You know, what we want, what do we want? What do we want to do? Well, the foundation wants to ensure that every child primarily in the world is not denied the ability to learn about STEM subjects, particularly computer and electronics through uh, a lack of um, hardware or a lack of support material or a lack of qualified teachers. So that's the foundation's mission. And my little slice of that mission is to make sure that nobody of any age 
is denied the opportunity to learn or the opportunity to build, you know, because a lot of our Raspberry Pis, over half the Raspberry Pis, we'll sell 7 million Raspberry Pis this year, um, and over half of those will go into industrial applications, into people making things on top of our platform. So we're very committed to making sure that nobody um, is denied the opportunity to learn or to make um, because of, uh, primarily because of cost. And, you know, that's probably you know, that's where that's where we compete. And we just had a kind of, I guess, an eight-year mission um, which is really, I think, came to fruition with Raspberry Pi 4 to make um, the Raspberry Pi as a PC claim true for most people. Yeah, very interesting. And, and now, um, you know, there's been a bunch of talks at this, uh, this Dev Summit, and there's probably more talks, I think, coming tomorrow uh, about, like, how the, the foundation work that we're doing to actually enable um, this kind of, eliminate this fragmentation around uh, um, hardware and sing, you know how how every all the all the different arm partners are building hardware slightly differently right and uh, we're trying to like do work around that and hopefully enable um, you know this kind of um, cloud native approach cloud native development to actually really reach the the edge um, rather than just living somewhere in the cloud um, and you know hopefully that's gonna enable even a and even more uh, opening up to, um, to to a bigger audience, I guess. So that's 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 interesting, right? I think we're we're um, we've got a couple of questions from the audience, so I wanted to kind of go through these. So first question is from Jason Andrews. So he's asking, how are things progressing with the 64-bit Raspberry Pi OS? Um, I was talking about this in the office today, actually. So they're progressing well. Um, I think probably if you look at the the gap between the 64-bit and the 32-bit in terms of functionality. Um, media acceleration is probably the biggest one, and we were spending some time today trying to kind of scope out exactly what our strategy is going to be. Um, a, we're trying to accomplish two things with the 64-bit OS. First of all, we're trying to move to 64-bit, um, particularly as we get larger um, uh, DRAM density SKUs of the product. It becomes more important. Obviously, you can get value out of an 8-gigabyte Raspberry Pi with a 32-bit OS because we ship with an LPAE kernel, 32-bit LPAE kernel. Um, but uh, if you want to get the maximum value out of it, obviously you want to be able to map all of your memory into the uh, address space of one process. So having a 64-bit OS is important. Um, so we're trying to move to 64-bit for 64-bit sake and for the sake of the applications that it enables. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're, we're taking the opportunity to retire a bunch of legacy um, structure um, in the system. I mean, as I think a lot of you know, Raspberry Pi has had a, has quite a large um, uh, closed binary object that runs on a DSP um, inside the uh, inside the system, and historically provided all of the multimedia functionality. Uh, it provides all the clocks and power, safety related stuff, and it also provides all the multimedia functionality. So, historically, Raspberry Pi say would negotiate um, the HDMI mode negotiation. Um, would happen um, in this blob. Uh, and what we've done over, over the time is to shave bits off this blob. The biggest change, one well, of the biggest change in that regard with Raspberry Pi 4 was we moved the graphics drivers from being inside the 3D drivers from being inside this blob to an open, uh, to an open uh, infrastructure based on uh, Mesa. Um, and what, we, what we're doing with the 64-bit OS, I have, um, I have children in the house. One of the wonderful things I think about lockdown for me has been it's been impossible for people to pretend that they don't have families. Um, <laughs> it's possible to, you know, it's been really wonderful seeing people, you know, it's very easy to go to work and be very serious. But of course, when you're working from home, you can't pretend that, there's, that, 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 you, that you aren't also a human being. Um, so you'll, you'll hear some, you, you'll, we'll have some musical accompaniment for the rest of the year. Uh, <laughs> Um, well, that's great. That, make, that makes you more human, right? <laughs> yeah, right? You know, it's lovely to discover all these people you thought were just business robots are actually human beings. Um, <laughs> so, so what we've so, so what we're doing with the sixty four bit OS is we are deliberately not uh, where we have um, remaining bits of functionality. A good example would be the camera stack, which was managed inside the um, the binary firmware. Um, on the sixty four bit OS, we use Live Camera, um, so we use an open um, so we we use we use an open standard for that. Um, the, um, the, the uh, media acceleration has been a victim of that. It's one of the reasons why we've not done media acceleration yet in 64-bit. And today we were kind of just trying to figure out how we tread that line between not bringing unnecessary amounts of uh, legacy um, code into the into the 64-bit world, where if we want to bring it in, it'll probably stay with us forever. Um, what we're trying to do is get media acceleration working without bringing too much legacy in with us. So I think we've got a strategy for that. 
Um, other than that, it's in pretty good shape, actually. Um, the um, the um, display output is currently managed by the blob. It's currently managed in closed source code. The aspiration is by the time um, the 64-bit OS goes, um, uh, goes, goes, by the time we get a release candidate uh, rather than a beta, um, that will have come under the purview of KMS. Uh, and there's work going on there, but it's a long, because um, it's an interop thing, right? You know, display negotiation is about, do you negotiate well with every television that was ever made? Uh, and we have a vast amount of, not just eight years of Raspberry Pi um, interop work. We have probably eight years of interop work at our silicon vendor on the front of that. So we've got 15, 16 years of interop work that you're trying to replicate in a piece of open source code. So, so that's probably, the, those are the two things, media acceleration and um, standards-based um, display output. Um, then we're pretty good to go, actually. A lot of people using it, a lot of people love it. Of course, there were a lot of other 64-bit um, operating system choices as well. Uh, you can get Ubuntu um, in particular, um, uh, which works very well. Cool, thank you for that, for that answer. Um, there is a really interesting question from David uh, here about um, you know, something, something very English. Um, so he's saying, I grew up with the, the BBC Micro and I feel like the Raspberry Pi is the SBC equivalent for this generation. But Microbit is more commonly regarded as its successor, so the, of the BBC Micro. Um, and he's asking, I guess, kind of a behind the scene question. Uh, were there ever talks with the BBC or anyone to be a more formal nationwide national scheme in the UK? Yes. So uh, we, we have, I think, a good brand in Raspberry Pi, um, uh, but we never really wanted a brand. Um, we kept going to the BBC and saying, hey, you know, we have some great technology. You have a brand which is associated with computing education. You should absolutely, um, you know, we should get together, um, uh, put these together. We don't want any money from you. You shouldn't want any money from us. We'll stick your brand on this, call it a BBC Micro Model C or something. And what they told us was that they could never do a piece of, um, that it would be inappropriate for the BBC to do a piece of um, uh, computer hardware. Uh, and that this was not something that they could engage with. Oh, very interesting. So, so you did approach them, but it didn't go. Yes, we, we we spent years <laughs> talking. We spent years talking to them. Um, you know, the the um, yeah, we spent um, probably uh, we founded it in two thousand eight, and we launched product in two thousand twelve, and we probably spent of those four years, we probably spent the first three years in meetings with the BBC, trying to get them to on and off, uh, trying to get them to engage with the idea of putting a BBC brand on the Raspberry Pi. Cool. Well, I guess it, it worked out anyway, so it's uh, it's great. Yeah, that's it's great. I mean, no, you're not sore about it, but uh, <laughs> yeah. it was. I mean, I think it's unfortunate, right? Um, you know, because obviously, you know, it was an amazing thing. The BBC, the BBC Computer Literacy Project, which is what the BBC Micro grew out of, um, was an amazing initiative. Um, one thing that's interesting about it is that it's not. Um, it, it's something I misunderstood because I didn't was exposed to the BBC Micro at school, and so I thought the Computer Literacy Project was about school children. Um, but one of our um, trustees uh, um, at the foundation is a lady called Tilly Blythe, who's a curator at the Science Museum in London. And she wrote a retrospective um, uh, a few years ago about the Computer Literacy Project. And of course, well, it wasn't until I read that that I realized actually the Computer Literacy Project was about adults. Uh, and it was about retraining adults in sunset industries, of which there were quite a few in the UK in the 1980s, for the new digital world. Um, and so it's always been something like in the back of my mind when I think about Raspberry Pi's mission, which is specifically and formally about young people. Um, it, it's always nice when I hear a story about somebody who's a little bit older, um, who's had a route into computing um, through Raspberry Pi, because that's a great echo of some of the really pioneering work that the BBC did back in the late 70s and early 80s. Yeah, uh, just to, to kind of end on, that, on, a, on a funny note here, um, this question. So David, the same person asked the question is saying, wow, thanks for answering my question. Going to call all, my, all of my pies BBC Micro Model C from now on. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. And of course we have C, D, E, F, D, and H. Um, <laughs> one of the things, of course, is when I was a child, I was at school and after the BBC Acorn, who I don't know what happened to Acorn in the end, I can't remember. Um, but um, they, they, they built a line of computers called the Acorn Archimedes, um, uh, which had a, a some 32-bit risk architecture. Um, and I used to look at these when I was a child and there was no hope of my ever affording one of these. I had a BBC and then I had an Amiga. Um, there was no hope of my affording an Archimedes. So I get a real kick out of the fact that um, uh, we are the, because you can risk OS, which is the operating system that ran on the Archimedes, um, uh, will run on Raspberry Pi. And so I get a real kick out of being the biggest vendor of risk OS compatible, um, uh, the biggest vendor of risk OS compatible hardware in the world. 
Um, it's kind of cool. cool. <laughs> I remember so, I remember the day that I bought a BBC micro magazine and it had an article about this thing called Arm in it. Um, and it had this, it talked about, you know, I still remember all of the stuff, you know, predicated execution, three stage pipeline, um, you know, avoiding pipeline stalls due to, due to by having predicated execution. Um, all of these things are like, wow, one day, you know, one day I'll have a machine with this architecture in. And yeah, there we are. <laughs> Got 35 million. So that's, that's. that's <laughs> well, you've done, you know, it's, uh, it, you've, you think you thought of a, something big and you've just done it right actually you've gone you've gone beyond right <laughs> the little dream of the of the child thinking i want to i want to have one of these right and you just created yeah. 35 million <laughs> but um cool so th there is an another question or another question on um from the chat uh, here saying uh while the big pi boards are super cool my favorite board is the pi zero w any plans for more boards in this series well, so I love Zero, and I, I think actually Zero is my favorite. Zero, Zero W maybe is my, maybe even Zero actually. Those are my favorite boards as well. Um, you know, because they they are so aggressively, you know, they're so aggressively designed. Uh, you know, so we've got a five dollar latte, the latte computer, uh, the five dollar computer, and the ten dollar computer. I just they kind of on some level for me they. They sum up everything we learn. Obviously, Zero is five years old next month. Uh, Zero W is about three and a half years old. Um, and they, for me, somehow they sum up everything that we learned in the first four years of in the first four, four years of doing Raspberry Pi. Um, a lot of people know we are we're, cons we're form factor constrained in Zero because um, Zero uses 2835, which is BCM 2835, which is the first generation ARM 11 based SOC that we used in Raspberry Pi One, and that's a pop package so the memory rests on top of the SOC um, and that's what lets us do that very dense form factor now the interesting thing about subsequent um, uh, subsequent SOCs the 2836 and 2837 SOCs is that they use discrete RAM um, and the problem there is that there's no room in the zero form factor for the RAM um, package um, and so that's the thing that's constrained us we'd love to do something it's something that comes up a lot um, and it comes up a lot whenever we have a conversation about what should we yeah, what should we do next whenever we ship something and we have that <sighs> and breathe um, uh, there's always like what should we do next and it's not ever been zero yet um, it's always been do another one of the big ones or do a derivative of the big one um, but we know that people love it I love it um, I'd love to find a way to do to put a bit more performance, and certainly in our, at least an ARM v7, if not an ARM v8 um, uh, um, uh, a processor core um, into that form factor, but we don't have a we don't we currently don't have a way around that form factor constraint. Um, uh, but I, I, well, I'd be very surprised if in another five years we've not done something. Um, but I don't have unfortunately I don't have anything that's particularly imminent. Oh, thank you for answering that. Um... I, I have another question here that's quite interesting. I think we, we kind of touched upon this before. So um, they're asking, how will Raspberry Pi 4 be used with ARM system ready? Can we run other OS with this technology? How will it benefit the end user? Um, do you have any visibility, any thoughts on that? So ARM system ready um, was the, the announcement made today about this standard, um, about this lower level standard, right, for um, boot boot sequences and uh, and firmware standards, and um, the the Raspberry Pi actually has been um, given a, a certification. Um, it's a big day for us, right? It's, exactly. I mean, it's really big news, right? Because you know we do believe that you know there's always a there's always a tension between standardization and differentiation um, uh, for, for I guess for silicon vendors and also for for, for um, platform companies like Raspberry Pi. It's like to what extent is it beneficial to our users to standardize um, because it lets us it lets them access more well. Uh, certainly more operating systems it, it makes it simpler to bring your operating system to a device if you don't have to worry about the lowest level of how that device works so it's kind of be helpful on the other hand you know we do have features in the soc and in the platform which we like to expose to people um uh, and you know a lot of the in-house software work we do at raspberry pi is about creating a differentiated off, op, uh, operating system offering so um uh, raspberry pi os is a differentiated offering you know it has a lot of work in there which is very raspberry pi specific um 
so I think you know the nice thing about the system ready certification is that it gives it hopefully it gives us a little bit of both it gives, it, you know we can continue to do our differentiated stuff um, uh, but it, it's maybe us turning that dial from um, 100 percent do differentiated stuff to 80 percent do differentiated stuff 20 percent invest in helping people bring their own more generic operating system experiences to the device and I was really really pleased with how easily it went onto the system here how easily how easily the system how feasible given the system wasn't designed with this in mind um it's it's kind of i think it's a it's an endorsement of the of the standardization processes it's an endorsement of the decisions that were made in the system ready program that you can take a platform which is well designed but was not specifically designed for system ready and get that platform to a state where it is system ready compliant um so that's that's you know that's exciting awesome thank you Thank you for sharing your view on that. Um, there is, so going back, I went back up and there is a, an interesting discussion actually between David and um, uh, another David <laughs> about, um, so the discussion is around uh, EMC, EMMC. Um, so when the, when the Pi first came out, I was really excited and ordered from the first batch, but my real, um, I guess electronic friends made fun of it uh, of it due, due to the use of SD cards, which will of course fail with rewrites. Are there any plans for EMMC or other otherwise onboard storage for coming pies? And I think David well, answered that there is well, there is a pie that has it actually. Well, I don't want to break anyone's heart, but an EMMC is just a solder down SD card, right? Uh, <laughs> it's an SD card that you can't replace when you exhaust its supply of life cycles. Um, so um, uh, yes, um, as as um, uh, David says um, uh, from, from our friends at Belena, um, the compute module has the MMC or has the MMC as an option. Uh, you know, we have a light variant of, of the of our compute. So compute module is our system or module version of Raspberry Pi, um, and um, it's. Uh, we have a version which have we have versions which have eight, sixteen, or thirty-two gigabytes of EMMC, and we have versions which have uh, which bring the um, SD EMMC interface out to an edge connector that you can then connect either to your own EMMC or to an SD card. Um, by and large, the we don't believe that there's any reliability difference between the two. Actually, um, there certainly is if you use the cheapest SD cards in the world. Um, but if you use brand name SD cards um, and you take care with power, um, because no flash, um, no flash based system really survives being brutalized, having its power um, interrupted at random moments. Because remember, you know, you're, you, when you have a, a device which uses flash as its back install, it's, it pretends to be a block device that's using flash as its back install. There's an enormous amount of work going on to launder the kind of essential ghastliness of flash. Uh, into something which looks like a, a spinning, a 10 megawatt spinning hard drive from 1970. Um, uh, and so if you interrupt the operation, so the flash, trans the, the flash translation layer, which is responsible for doing that, which has its own storage for storing, you know, bad blocks, um, you know, uh, reshuffling um, uh, your wear leveling, um, the, the flash, the main flash. Um, if you interrupt the operation of the FTL at the wrong moment by cutting its power, um, there's pretty much no guarantee, and that's EMMC or SD um, cards, there's pretty much no guarantee that um, that something bad won't happen. Um, by and large, what we found is if, you, if you're if you using branded SD cards, uh, or you're, and particularly if you're using branded industrial SD cards, so SD cards which are designed to be more resilient to this kind of thing, there's no, there's no difference. There's no... Um, there's no difference between SD and the MMC. Um, obviously, there's a mechanical difference um, in that one is socketed and one is not. And there may be vibration, say vibration environments where you prefer to have a MMC. It's, a, it's, a, it's, um, it's something that comes up a lot, actually, should we offer a variant of the SBC product, which has the MMC on it. Um, we've not got there yet. We've not, never got there, but it is an interesting thought. And I think it's one that, uh, it's one we come back to, and I wouldn't be surprised one day to see us do something do something in that space. But for now, as, as David says, you have the compute module if that's really what you want. But I would caution about EMMC. It's not the solution to really any problems um, at all, other than being soldered down, which is great. <laughs> cool. Well, um, at the moment, we don't have any more questions from the audience. So if, uh, unless I missed something. So if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, 
If not, I think, I mean, for now we can give keep on, I can, I have a bunch of questions, so I can ask you um, a couple of questions. You're, you're being, um, you're being told, you're being told you missed something. Oh, did I miss something? Alina, uh, oh. where is it? Any update? Oh, no, wait, we had that. Um, it's four. from Les. Ah, there was an ask, there was an ask about Compute Module 4. Compute Module yeah. 4? Yes, yeah, there was, I missed okay. that. Yes. Ah. Yes. Um, cool. Um, yeah, well, there's no update, except that it's coming. Um, the, uh, every time we generate an SPC, every time we generate an iteration of the primary platform, uh, with the exception of Raspberry Pi 2, which wasn't, which wasn't the prime product, Raspberry Pi 2 was only the prime product in the market for 13 months. Um, so there was no time to generate a Compute Module 2, but there's a Compute Module 1, a 3, a 3 plus. Um, there will be a Compute Module 4. Um, I think we've talked more openly. We don't tend to talk about un unannounced products, but we, we've talked quite openly about Compute Module 4, partly because we have a great partnership with NEC. Um, so um, NEC make digital, um, uh, make digital signage um, displays, very high intensity um, uh, LCD displays, uh, often intended for outdoor use or, or use in highly illuminated environments. Um, and they have a standard for allowing you to put a compute module, a Raspberry Pi product in the back of their display. Um, so um, we, we have had announcements with them about, about compute module four. Um, so we've been, that's a really important engagement to us because it, it really validates that an absolute top of the line blue chip company making amazing and quite expensive products sees Raspberry Pi as being the right platform for doing for adding compute to their display. So we talk, we love that relationship and we, we, we've, uh, we broke our rules, our traditional rules about, about compute module, uh, about product pre-announcements in order to support that relationship. Um, it's coming, it's coming this year. It's coming quite soon. Um, uh, design is complete. Design of the product is complete. Design of the carrier board is complete. Um, it's, um, it's, it's nice actually. I've, I've, seen, I've seen them, um, I've seen them, I've seen them in the factory. So I've seen them in production. Um, so they are very, they are fairly imminent, um, and I, I think people are going to like it. We, we, we've, it's a bit of a departure. There's been a little bit of a departure um, in terms of um, form factor, um, uh, but I think people are going to like it. I think it's an improvement in a lot of ways. And we put more, we put more features on, and we have, we we really listen to customer feedback. We compute modules a big business for us now. We're doing about compared small compared to the SBC business, but we're doing over half a million. Um, compute modules a year now, so it's a substantial business from us. We have a lot of we have a lot of different customers, um, and really, what we try to do with CM4 is listen to those customers and just snipe off you know, what were the pain points because we obsess all the time over why do people leave Raspberry Pi? People prototype on Raspberry Pi, but that's not our aspiration. Our aspiration is for people to prototype on Raspberry Pi and stay with us as they go to volume. And a lot of people do. You know, we have a lot of 10, 20, 30, 50,000 unit customers. Um, uh, one thing with compute module is, you know, what are the things, uh, you know, what are the things that cause people to not want to use compute module to either move to other SIMs or to go chip on board? Um, and really what we tried to do with CM4 is to resolve a few of those items, particularly around compliance, actually, there's been a lot of work has gone into compliance on CM4. Cool. Actually, that was, that kind of leads well to another question I wanted to ask you in terms of, um, people going to product, right? Like how is, how do you see that path to product with Raspberry Pi? And you know, when, when is uh, an SOM actually the right answer and when is Raspberry Pi the right answer? And before I let you answer, actually, I was gonna say a few years ago, I was actually quite surprised when I found um, an underwater Rover uh, having a Raspberry Pi in it, right? I found it at Maker Faire in San Francisco. And it was quite interesting because when I was talking to the, to the team, I was asking, you know, why, why do you have a full Raspberry Pi in there? It's like, well, actually the cost of that is, you know, it's not really, it, it, we're not doing. We're not shipping millions of these. It's not really justifiable to to go any you know any any simpler than that. So, yeah, I wanted to hear your thoughts and uh, yeah, your vision yeah. of that. Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? So so you know the path to product with Raspberry Pi is broadly, if you have a um, you you can kind of draw a flowchart. Um, you prototype with Raspberry Pi, so you pro, you almost always prototype with the 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 current top of the line. Um, a Raspberry Pi SBC product because it's the least constrained product. So today you probably go buy the $75 product. So you can probably go buy the eight gig, um, yeah, most expensive thing we've ever made um, and incredibly popular. 
um, yeah, we're really struggling to keep that particular one on the shelves. Um, but yeah, you go buy the four gig or the eight gig Raspberry Pi four. You develop your application. Uh, you see, you develop your software, and then you've kind of got a choice. Um, and the choice boils down to um, if you have a lot of physical space inside your product. If you have, if you're not very form factor constrained, generally people stay with the SBC. Uh, and the world is full. We sometimes call the internet of big things. Um, you know, the world is actually full of, um, you know, a, a air conditioner. You know, it was one of our earliest industrial design ones, actually, it was an air handling HVAC, air handling unit, um, which was an old, it was an, an existing product line and a company put, made IoT HVAC units, internet connected HVAC units by cutting a hole in the side of a, of a one of their existing products and exposing the ports of the Raspberry Pi through the side of it. Uh, it worked incredibly well. Um, so, so if you if you're not constrained in terms of form factor, then uh, the Raspberry Pi itself may be the way forward. If you're constrained in terms of form factor, then the compute module and designing your own baseboard to largely to shuffle the connectors around. It's usually about shuffling the connectors around. Um, uh, is um, you design a baseboard, you integrate a compute module into it, uh, and then you have a finished product. Um, the um, so that that can work, or you escape from our ecosystem uh, and you go and uh, take buy some other um, uh, SOC um, uh, uh, for, for your sins, um, and you uh, you go and you build a product. You port your you port your software. You build a product and you port your uh, software across onto that product, some other ARM, generally other ARM platform, um, and you put and you, you put some software porting effort in. Um, now the interesting thing is the interesting things for us are how do we how do we make sure people don't end up on that last having to end up on that because nobody wants to end up on that last arm, right? How do we stop people from needing to end up on that last arm? Um, one thing we've done a lot of, uh, for example. Um, there's a notion of modular conformance. So it's all actually all about conformance. There's a notion about since we started putting radios in our product, um, there are useful things we can do for our customers to help them want to stay in our ecosystem. Um, so we can, um, so uh, Raspberry Pi 3 is the first product we made with wireless. Zero W has wireless. And then we did 3 Plus. And the interesting thing between 3 and 3 Plus is we put a can over the Wi Fi. Um, and what that the, the Wi-Fi bit of circuitry on the board has a can over it. What that means is that we can be modular. We can offer modular conformance. Um, so effectively, we go do the FCC work associated with having a radio. Um, and then when you build a product on top of Raspberry Pi three uh, plus or Raspberry Pi four, um, you don't need to go and do all of that Wi-Fi certification again. You can pe because our radio is isolated on the board, you can leverage all of that work. And it's a vast amount of work, right? Because we go and conform in every country in the world. We spend hundreds and hundreds conforming a Raspberry Pi product doesn't cost much less than a million dollars. Uh, and so we'll go do all that for you. Um, so, so that's kind of probably one direction. I think there is a little bit of a, there's a bit of kind of machismo about building your own board, uh, about going, um, I think people go chip on board, go build their own SBC effectively um, too soon. Um, there's a real desire in some engineering teams to do this at a thousand unit volume. And we certainly don't think it's ever worth porting off unless you know, because you're going to have to do some software work. You've got to amortize the cost of that software work across a lot, across a lot of units for it to be worth doing. Um, and so we don't ever really feel it's, that a, it's a never, it's seldom a rational decision to move away from the Raspberry Pi platform below 10,000 units volume. Um, but it does happen anyway. And I think it happens um, out of a sense of machismo. So sometimes it happens for, for genuine reasons, but often it's a, it's a sense of machismo. And we, so that's an education job for us. It's about trying to improve our value proposition and modular conformance is one way of doing that. Uh, and it's an education job to explain to people that there are challenges. Obviously we've met a lot of, I was going to say most of the challenges, I'm sure we've not met most, I'm sure, sure, I'm sure there's still a decade of challenges <laughs> left, but we've met a lot of the challenges that are involved in building Raspberry Pi like product. Uh, and we have an education, an honest education job, not, not a selling job, an honest education job to explain to people how challenging this stuff becomes, particularly when radio gets involved. Cool, thank you for that. That's really interesting. Um, we've got another couple of interesting questions here. So one more, one is actually um, about, uh, so the la I'm reading the last one first. Do you know of any rad hard pies? I know you have some in space. 
Um, so, so we, so we don't have. So it's interesting. So, so um, ra Raspberry Pi silicon is built on um, a conventional CMOS process, right? Um, so it doesn't have the intrinsic rad hardness of either the kind of in, um, the kind of designed in rad hardness of some like a silicon on sapphire process, or the accidental rad hardness of a silicon on insulator process. Um, so a lot of the what what do you um, what does soft fail? You've got kind of hard failures and soft failures. You have actual hard failures where something comes in with enough energy to actually destroy some bit of the chip. Um, you have soft failures where something comes in with enough energy to flip a bit in a, in a bit of memory, hopefully a bit of volatile memory, so you can just reboot. Um, and then you have a middle ground, this kind of latch up middle ground. So there's a kind of a parasitic, if you you can end up building like it's like a thyristor or so you end up building these kind of parasitic structures if you inject energy into um a, a silicon device at the right point you can build um latch up structures you can get self-sustaining structures which short things out and they're not it's they're not hard failures but they are very persistent soft failures or persist across reboots um and silicon and sapphire and, and, and soi are have some resilience um, to this because of the insulating substrate that they're sat on top of. Um, we're built on conventional CMOS, both um, uh, Pi 1 through 3, which are 40 nanometer uh, products, and Pi 4, which is a 28 nanometer product. Um, so, so we don't have any intrinsic resistance. However, what we've discovered, we, we fly two, we have two Raspberry Pis on the space station. Um, well, we, we have two Raspberry Pis on the space station. What's interesting is those are probably not the only Pis on the station. Um, a lot of uh, payloads end up having Pis inside them because they're known good products. They are actually known to be, I have to say, they're known to be quite resilient. Um, so at any given time, there are will be a handful, probably between five and 10 Raspberry Pis on the station. Um, they're extremely robust, actually. Um, what we've discovered is they reboot a lot less than the station laptops. Um, in significant measure, I think that's actually because the target is rather smaller. Um, you have uh, what's up there at the moment has ARM 11s in it, uh, and they're tiny. Um, they're, I think it's a, about a 0.7 square mil. If you actually want to disrupt, there's system infrastructure that you could disrupt. But if you actually want to hit the ARM, you've got to hit a 0.7 square mil target on the, on the die. And actually, that's, that's super helpful. Um, in, in terms of in terms of hardening the device, um, so so yeah, we, so we are we are we have some hardness, but we're not formal rad hardness. Um, if we fly Pi's in the future, they're likely to be Raspberry Pi fours. Um, it'll be interesting to see. We don't have any data yet on how the twenty eight nanometer socks uh, perform. They obviously they're on a more advanced process node. Um, the arms are physically rather larger. You know, a quad A seventy two with a meg of L two is rather larger than a, a, a single arm eleven with no L two. Um, so perhaps there's more scope there for radiation to cause mischief. Cool. I've actually got a follow-up. So my background is in physics. I used to work on uh, kind of building the electronics for for physics detectors. Um, I wonder if there is anything that if anybody you know in in universities research has used Raspberry Pis in uh, physics detectors. I'm thinking about the LHC or other kind of big accelerators and stuff like that. Do you know of any like that? I, I, so I, so I, don't, I wouldn't be at all surprised. I don't, um, I don't know. If, I don't know of anything. I'm afraid they do show up everywhere. Of course, you know, CERN has been a big um, center for, um, for for Raspberry Pi uh, work over the years. The uh, the Magpie, which is now our official magazine, but was originally a fan magazine, came out of CERN. Um, and so there is a um, there's there's obviously yeah, any way you get you know physicists are, tend to be computer and electronics geeks often. Um, and, and so there's 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 always there's always some crossover. The stuff you see actually the, the biologic the biology crossover tends. You mentioned a, a underwater um, ROV. Um, uh, you, you get that kind of crossover. Um, we've seen them over winter in the Antarctic filming penguins. You know, hmm. uh, what what other environments isn't the sock designed for? Well, it's not really designed to overwinter in Antarctic. It's quite a brutal environment. Um, but it turns out that you know. Um, a lot of the work you do to make a sock which is reliable in a mobile phone um, is also actually the work that you know you, you, you can't get you can't there, there's no sort of uh, level of diligence which is sufficient to get something into a mobile phone but it doesn't also happen to be diligent enough to work on the international space station or um, 
uh, or in uh, or, or in Antarctica in the winter. Um, so we've kind of benefited from that. And of course, we also benefited. We have done quite a lot of work on the. It's very easy to focus just on the SOC, but of course, you know, there's a lot of other stuff on that board, you know, particularly things like CAPS, where, you know, the, the performance of the SOC is very dependent on the behavior of the capacitors that you, that you use to decouple those power supply. And so there's a lot of the performance of the crystal, which is generating its reference, its clock reference. So a lot of effort has gone into uh, making sure those ancillary components are robust ac across quite a broad range of operating environments. Very interesting. Yeah, I remember actually the the um, oscillator is actually something that you know is really key when, when you do electronics hardened electronics right because if you get that wrong then if that gets you know starts failing then you're you're screwed right and we, um, and we are and we are just using you know we are just using crystals right i mean these are just these they are just crystals uh, but they are quite shiny crystals they're quite they're quite um high spec um crystals and of course they have to be high spec because when you're doing things like 4k p60 hdmi you know, you do need very accurate clock references. You know, it's and you don't want your 4K P60 HDMI to only work up to 50 degrees. You know, you need it to work if someone bakes your device as well. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. And this is what I mean when I say, you know, eight years of experience. That's what you're buying when you buy a Raspberry Pi SPC or Raspberry Pi SOM. You're, you're buying eight years of us having had bad, bad days, really. You know, you're buying our recovery from eight years of, of, of oh, that didn't work. Why didn't that work? Spend a week finding it. You know, and 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 that's you know, it, it's it's wonderful to be involved. I mean, I you know, I I manage engineers now. I, I don't do a lot of frontline engineering myself, um, uh, but it's wonderful to be around people who are having these experiences and to participate in them vicariously. Some of the <laughs> cool. So I'll ask you um kind of um some a question I have, and then we'll we'll go to another question from David. Um, so I was wondering in your journey up to today what was your biggest challenge with raspberry pi in respect to raspberry pi like what was the kind of point where you where you thought oh i'm gonna give up now this is this is way too hard <laughs> uh, I, I mean I'll, I'll pick a i'll pick two i guess uh I'll pick three um the first one getting the thing into the market at the price point um you know, when we told people in May of 2011 we were going to do this, we had a back of an envelope calculation. I really mean a calculation on the back of an envelope that said that it was feasible. And the back of an envelope just had the prices of the main bits of silicon on there, the network controller, the SOC, and the, and the RAM. And they were much less than $35. So, you know, we, we've done it. Let's just, and then what you discover actually is that it's not those components that kill you, it's the resistors and the capacitors, and <laughs> particularly the connectors and the power supply components. Um, because what you have is like you have three things that cost more than a dollar, or if you include the PCB. Um, but what you have is hundreds of things that cost between one cent and 10 cents. And it's those things that push you over the, push you over the line and even before you've assembled it. So 2011 was very hard um, because we had promised we staked our credibility on the fact we could do this. Um, and, and then we discovered that Pete Lomas and I, Pete Lomas designed the first generation hardware. Pete, Pete and I discovered that there was a lot of um, optimization of the bill of materials. One of my, um, the only time Raspberry Pi nearly got me killed was um, I was at the airport, I was at Heathrow Airport flying to, um, uh, flying to California uh, in the autumn of 2011. And I was speaking to Pete on the phone and I, I was in the departure lounge and I said to him on the phone, have you got the latest version of the bomb, uh, the bill of materials? Um, have you got the latest version of the bomb? Because I'm going to get on the plane and I can do a lot of work on the bomb in eight hours. You know? um, and I gradually became aware there was a circle of silence expanding away from me as I was going on about bombs. Um, uh, the circle of silence expanding away from me through the departure lounge. And um, fortunately, it didn't intersect with any of the gentlemen with the submachine guns. Um, and I was a bill of materials. It's the things that go in electronic product. Please don't kill me. Um, so, so that was fun, and that was that was something that went on right the way up to the launch, right the way through the launch process. So that was one. Another one that happened immediately after the launch process was conformance was our first inter interaction with conformance and compliance. Um, there's a general belief that you don't need to do compliance testing on developer boards. Um, generally, if you buy a developer board, it may, it may not have had a full set of FCC and CE work done on it. And of course, we thought we were a development board. Uh, the first product was intended to be a, a prototype of development board. And so we thought we didn't have to conform. Uh, and then we were informed that if you take 100,000 orders for something, which is what we took on our first day, uh, you're not a development board anymore. You're a product. Conform. And the interesting thing about conformance is that you can't test a product into conformance. Um, 
it's a physical property of a device. It either conforms or doesn't. And we made thousands of them, right? <laughs> thousands of these products, and we not only conformance testing on them. And so we had this frantic um, effort to you know, get them in a test chamber and see if they radiate. And we were very fortunate. I mean, Pete, Pete had done a lovely job on the design, and they were whisper quiet. Um, but it was certainly a, a miserable few days uh, when we thought that our product, we might have to scrap everything we built. And that would have scrapped all of our money. That would have scrapped, we would have been done for because we would spend all our money. The only way of getting our money back was to sell the product. If we couldn't sell the product, we were doomed. Um, so that was another one. And then I guess probably the last one was getting the 28 nanometer sock for um, the way we did Pi 2 and Pi 3 was to stick progressively larger core complexes onto the side of basically the same piece of silicon. It's, if you look at a Raspberry uh, Pi 3, um, if you looked at it under an electron microscope, what you'd see would be the same structure. Most of the chip is the same, and it has very obviously a, a Cortex A53 bolted on the side of it. Um, uh, 28 nanometers was a complete sock redevelopment. And so kind of getting to a point where we could justify that, where there was a business case to justify not, it's an order of magnitude different, difference in cost between those two operations. And so Raspberry Pi 4 was never a done deal. Uh, Raspberry Pi could have ended with Raspberry Pi 3 uh, or 3 plus, um, because that might've been all we could, that sort of light touch Modification to 40 nanometer socks might have been the only thing we could justify financially, but fortunately the volumes got large enough we, we could justify a, a 28 nanometer development. So those are the three things. Awesome, thank you for sharing. <laughs> that was uh, that was funny. I, I I love the idea. Like it took me a, a second actually to understand why the the police would uh, would, would shoot you, and then I was like, oh wait, okay. I was enjoy. I was enjoy flying into um, flying into Mumbai, um, M M Mumbai Airport because it still has the airport code B O N. <laughs> so it's on your it's on your it's on your boarding pass. Bob. <laughs> that, that's awesome. <laughs> cool. So uh, we've got one one question from from Twitter actually, um, and, and then a question from uh, uh, David here. So um, someone on Twitter is asking when um, or. You know, are you thinking of doing an SPSA based Raspberry Pi? Um, that's a very good question. Um, we, the, let's see, um, people do use Raspberry Pis in that context. So that, that, that application domain is very popular for Raspberry Pis, actually, particularly Raspberry Pi 4s as they become, network connections become faster and we have more memory and a more powerful processor. Um, uh, I, I, you know, it's the unannounced product thing, right? Um, I think we, we're aware of the opportunity and and just, um, you know, we're aware of the opportunity. My comments earlier about standardization versus differentiation apply in that space um, as much as they do in, uh, probably applying a little bit more in that um, your, a lot of the argument for differentiation is around multimedia. Um, and, and that doesn't necessarily apply so much in the SPSA world. Um, so, so I wouldn't be surprised to see us do something there. Um, we don't have any announced products. We actually, we actually don't have any. I can, you know, scouts on it. We, we, we don't have any any products in prototype uh, in that space at the moment. Um, but it, it is an opportunity we're aware of. And so we think we can bring a lot of value. Actually, um, you know, they are the, the socks we use are incredibly powerful little server things. Um, and I do think we can bring some value value there, uh, which is comparable to to, uh, to what you see from people who are laser focused on that market. Awesome! Thank you for answering that. We'll uh, we'll tell our Twitter friend to to watch the recording <laughs> as he's not on here. Um, awesome! So we've got one more question from uh, from David. Uh, I think this is an interesting one. One I wanted to ask as well. What was the most unexpected, mind blowing use of a, of a pie? Uh, that you've seen and, and could have never imagined when you first started this project? Well, okay, putting them on the space station is amazing. Right? <laughs> um, uh, uh, but we did that, so that's cheating. Um, other people have done it as well. So it's kind of amazing to me that other people have done it. Um, uh, so so that's, that's one thing. Um, early on, I thought the ballooning was pretty cool, actually. Um, people putting them under weather balloons and, and, and taking pictures of the Earth from the edge of space. Um, what, what I thought was amazing about that was it was a, a kind of a, it was the first example of a thing which was a geeky thing um, that fed back into education. So, um, you know, a lot of the work the foundation does is, is focused on education. The interesting thing about the ballooning was that, that all of a sudden, so you start off with 40 year old geeks sending pies into space. And before you know it, you have high school 
teachers and their classes sending pies into space um, and or to the edge of space. Uh, and then you have primary school kids sending pies to the edge of space. And it was a really interesting example of how um, uh, uh, it's a kind of a, a microcosm of really the, uh, the whole story of Raspberry Pi in education, which is that, that it's easy to imagine that the way to succeed in education is steepest descent is to build an organization that, who, that focuses, and of course we have that in the foundation, an organization that focuses on competing education. But a lot of the success we've had, as, as, a significant fraction of the success we've had, has been from this indirect route of making a tool that adults with a passion use to share that passion with younger people. Um, and, and ballooning is like a, the way that ballooning worked, where, where it started with adults, trickle down through schools and then in fact the foundation picked it up and started running education programs to teach you to do this uh, was quite a nice microcosm of, of how well that can work if you just give people tools um one more the cucumber sorter i always mention this cucumber sorter but i'll mention it again um the the, the a wonderful uh, engineer in japan whose parents run a cucumber farm uh who, who trained a tensorflow um, model running on a Raspberry Pi to discriminate between the 23 different categories of Japanese spiny cucumber um, based on length, the number of spines and colour and straightness and stuff uh, to save his aging parents the effort of sorting every cucumber into, into the right bucket. Um, and that, that's, another, that's, that's also mentioned, it sounds silly, but it's, it's that one is totemic, where ballooning is totemic for um, education. This is totemic for Raspberry Pi as a tool for enabling professional engineers to do the things they need to do with little cost and little friction. Um, uh, so that's, uh, and that idea of the Raspberry Pi is a piece of glue between the physical world and the virtual world, the physical world and the computational world. Um, uh, it, and the cucumber sort of sat for me. That's really yeah, interesting. Cucumber, yeah, and, and as David says, cucumber sort of beats pies in space. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know what's what's interesting i was, I was talk, we had an open hours yesterday with the uh, office hours i keep on saying open hours office hours with uh, massimo banzi from arduino and it was interesting we had a, a really interesting chat on the fact that um you know the there are professional you just mentioned professional developers right i think we all have a different idea of who professional developers are what massimo was saying is actually that professional developers in his view are not just the ones that are professional in embedded but also the ones that might be professional in their own fields right and they yes. might need a tool, right? And I think, you know, you just said, you just, you know, exactly to that point, you just said Raspberry Pi can be a tool for someone that might need to do X, right? Mm -hmm. And they need the tool to do it, right? And Raspberry Pi is the tool, right? And that's- And that's, that's, that's a thing we have in common with Arduino. We are a platform for enabling a broader range of people to solve problems with computation. Um, you know, and that's, that's, it's, it's very, very powerful within, you know, one of the interesting things for us that's specific to us is because we are a Linux box, because we're a PC, um, what we've done is we've brought a lot of work, which you'd consider to be embedded work, you know, embedded engineers are special, right? Um, what we've actually allowed is a much broader range of people who might consider themselves to have been enterprise professionals, people who are used to writing software on Unix boxes, um, to come play in and solve problems in and create value in the embedded space. Um, and that's... And now, you know, and you see that in the Arduino space as well, you know, as um, you, you get ARM-based Arduino devices that can run um, uh, languages like MicroPython, um, you're bringing a much broader range of people into embedded. Uh, um, and that's exciting, right? Because there's, there are way more, you know, you know, your statistics for how many ARM cores get solved. There are way more um, problems to solve than there are, you know, hairy hairy embedded engineers um, uh, to solve them. So, you know, broadening participation is really, really important. And it's somewhere where we've really followed in the footsteps of the work that Massimo has done. Cool. Um, I think, I think we're, we're, we need to wrap up, but um, one cheeky question from Louise <laughs> is, uh, will you come to the next in-person Dev Summit? You have to say it here. You have to. You have to come. Yeah, I, I, I will come to the next in person. I I miss. As I said before. I said before we uh, before we started. I miss travel so much. Um, I I I I miss. One of the things that makes Raspberry Pi exciting for me is I get to come out and meet with people who've done amazing work. And, and while there've been advantages to the last six months in terms of being able to stay home and focus and spend time with my family, um, you know that is an important part of the Raspberry Pi mission for me. And it's something I will I will be there next year. I'll be there every year if you'll have me. Awesome, and uh, I think we met actually in Japan when we did yes. our first uh, our first event, um, and we we had you know I had the chance to to meet you and to meet Masafumi, one of the leader of the Japanese uh, um, yeah. Raspberry Pi community that now that's now an ARM innovator. And it's, it was really interesting to see you know 
this community of Raspberry Pi users in Japan and what they're doing, right? It's uh, super interesting. Very it's very exciting. So I'm looking forward to it. And I, I, I watch the, I can now travel to Japan, I see. I can't yet travel to the United States. Um, so, but you know, I will be on the, I've said to people I will be on the first plane. I will be on the first plane when it's legal again. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Eben, for for taking all these answer or all these questions and answering answering them. Uh, it was a pleasure for me to ask my own questions. <laughs> uh, it was a good opportunity to, I think, for everyone to to be able to ask their questions. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for watching. And if you do, you have any last thoughts that you want to share with everybody? Maybe a last uh, shameless oh. plug. Oh, shameless plug. No, shameless plug. I'll do this thing. This too will pass, right? We've had a strange year, haven't we? Um, but it's been, you know, all of us in the technology community have a part to play in getting out of the hole that we found ourselves in. I mean, the, the, the most exciting, rewarding work I've done in the last six months has been about COVID has been about trying to solve problems. Uh, and so much of the, so much of the, the, the positive response to the situation we're in has been about technology and it's been about community. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're, what I hope is that, you know, as technologists, we'll be able to look back on what we've done over this, hopefully now, not too long till the end of it, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to look back on over the, you know, the year that we spent doing this and, and feel, feel pleased with the contribution we've made. Um, so yeah, go technology, go community. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's close.